Voilà, nous allons commencer. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues and friends, good morning. Good afternoon for those joining us from the Middle East and elsewhere. Welcome to the annual event of the United Nations Committee on the Exercise of the Labor Rights of the Palestinian People, held on the margins of the sixth, eighth session commission on the status of, of women, CSW 68. My name is uh, Sheikh Nyan. I'm the chair of the committee and permanent representative of Senegal to the UN. On behalf of the committee, let me exp express our appreciation for you being here today. Since its creation in uh, 1975, the General Assembly has regularly renewed the mandate of this committee to promote the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people, including their right to self-determination as provided by international law and enshrined in the UN Charter. The committee raises awareness on the question of Palestine and particularly on the daily challenges faced by Palestinians under occupation. In so doing, we engage with the UN partners and civil society in the occupied Palestinian territory, Israel and elsewhere. The committee's activities aim at mobilizing efforts uh, to end the Israeli occupation and at achieving the realization of the two-state solution and a sustainable peace. The committee's annual event on the margin of CSW offers a unique opportunity for committee members and observers and the public at large to assess the impact on women of Israeli unlawful policies and practices since the 1948 Nagba to the present day throughout the occupied Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem. Since the 7th of October 2023, Palestinians in Gaza have injured the most brutal and unprecedented levels of violence, compounded by the 16 years of the Israeli blockade, which have turned into a humanitarian catastrophe. Nearly one million women and, children and, and girls children and newborns in Gaza are disproportionately bearing the burden of the conflict, as reported by several UN agencies and, and in Jews. The deliberate restriction to access to food, water, health care, and sanitation, as well as the destruction of medical facilities in bringing the over 2 million Palestinians in Gaza to the brink of famine and death, all this in addition to the massive displacement and ethnic cleansing. Ladies and gentlemen, the horrifying attacks in Israel by Hamas and other groups and the taking of hostages do not justify Israel's actions in Gaza. The committee strongly condemns Israel's indiscriminate attacks, resulting in over 30,000 Palestinian deaths including over 9,000 women killed and more than 11,000 children killed, widespread destruction of infrastructure, leading to starvation, disease, and mass displacement. The committee calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, the unconditional release of all hostages, and the unhindered access of humanitarian aid. During this holy month of Ramadan, the victim's pain is felt even more acutely. The whole world is watching on live TV the ongoing Nagba, an unfolding situation that amounts to plausible genocide, as per the International Court of Justice decision, and the human-made tragedy that will stain our collective conscience for generations to come. The panelists will discuss these issues today. Building upon the catastrophic situation in Gaza and drawing from the CSW 68, Today's event is dedicated to discussing the war on Gaza, impact on women and children. To highlight the challenges faced by Palestinians, especially women and children, and to reflect on the long lasting intergenerational trauma inflicted upon Palestinians through endless cycles of war, occupation, and siege. We trust that this exchange will contribute to our knowledge of the, of the situation and, the finding, and, and to finding a resolution to the question of Palestine. 
Let us now start with today's program. I will first give the floor to Ambassador Freda Abdel Hadi Nasser, Deputy Permanent Observer of the State of Palestine to the UN. Then we will hear from the panelists and after the presentations, we will open the floor first to for questions and co comments from committee members and observers, and then uh, I will give the floor to the audience. Please note that participation in the virtual platform is limited to UN member and observer states, as well as the panelists. However, the general public can view the event on UN Web TV, and they can submit their question via the committee's X account, Twitter, the Twitter account and the email dpr-meeting at un.org. The event is being recorded and streamed on UN Web TV, and it will be posted on municipalun.org, the committee's website, maintained by the Division of Palestinian Rights. Now, let me give the floor to Ambassador Freda Abdelhadi Nate, Deputy Permanent Observer of the State of Palestine to the UN, for her opening remarks. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador Nyang, uh, for your statement and for convening this event to focus our attention on the impact of Israel's war on Gaza uh, on Palestinian women and children. We are grateful to the committee for its long-standing solidarity with the Palestinian people and advocacy with countries across all regions, focused today on a ceasefire as the most immediate priority to save human lives alongside the committee's long-standing pursuit of an end to Israel's colonial occupation of Palestine and the realization of the Palestinian people's inalienable rights, including to self-determination and return the pillars of a just and peaceful solution to this prolonged historic injustice. The committee's mandate to raise awareness by ensuring understanding of the facts and the realities of the situation and efforts to engage the international community to uphold international law in regards to the Palestine question are needed now more than ever. So thank you for bringing together this expert panel uh, to share with us their expertise on the plight of Palestinian women and children in Gaza. We will listen very carefully to the presentations and recommendations as we collectively consider how to further mobilize international action to address the plight of Palestinian women and children and ensure accountability for all the human rights, violations and abuses against them for what has been and is an endless Nakba. As I am certain uh, that the panelists will present many relevant facts, I will just make a few remarks in this regard. Mr. Chair, distinguished delegates, women and children in Gaza and the rest of Palestine are bearing the heaviest burdens of Israel's illegal occupation and its relentless acts of violence, colonization, ethnic cleansing, collective punishment and persecution. Using every form of lethal weaponry, even starvation as a weapon of war, Israel's barbarity against the defenseless Palestinian civilian population and the scope of scale and destruction it is inflicting are unprecedented in this century and unparalleled since World War II. The Palestinian writer Susanna Bulhawa has described the situation as such, quote, Gaza is hell. It is an inferno teeming with innocence, gasping for air, end quote. Those not killed by the terror of bombs, missiles, and gunfire by Israel's army and settlers are now being starved to death under an inhumane siege on food, water, and other basic means of survival, and all as they endure the misery of forced displacement, deprived of the sanctity and safety of their homes, exposed to rampant violent disease and trauma, bearing untold indignities every day, a struggle to survive. Women and children are the majority of casualties of this genocidal war in Gaza, with over 9,000 women killed by the Israeli occupying forces and more than 13,000 babies and children killed as of today. They are among the more than 31,000 Palestinians 
killed in five months of unbridled carnage by Israel, a toll comprising also thousands of men, youth, and elderly, hundreds of humanitarians, teachers, doctors, medics, and journalists. This is what led the Secretary General and the heads of UN agencies of UNRWA, UNICEF, OCHA, and others to declare months ago that Gaza has become, quote, a graveyard for children. More children have been killed in Gaza in these past five months than in all conflicts worldwide in the past four years. This is a war on children, but it is also a war on women. As the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Occupied Palestine, Francesca Albanese has stated, this war is destroying a population from its roots. An average of 67 women are killed every day, among them 37 mothers. For the children who do survive, thousands have been orphaned, 17,000 children at last count. The pain unfathomable, and cumulative impact, both short and long-term, immeasurable. The torment, dehumanization, and mass atrocities being committed by Israel against women and children as the world looks on shock the human conscience and debase our collective humanity. So as we consider the international community's responsibilities to address this catastrophic humanitarian and human rights crisis we appeal for empathy and solidarity as the antidote to cruelty and depravity we are witnessing to help guide our actions to protect, heal, and give hope to Palestinian women and children and to stop impunity and bring them justice and liberate them from this oppression. So I ask all who are with us today to please think about what it feels like for the mother who cannot feed her children who cannot bathe and clothe them, who cannot keep them safe and listens day and night to their cries of hunger and fear, of pain from their wounds, of the new mother who has given birth amid the rubble and cannot nurse her newborn, vulnerable to malnutrition and disease in the most unsanitary conditions, the hungry child forced to search for food for his family only to be gunned down awaiting the aid convoy or crushed to death by humanitarian aid dropped from the sky. To think about the young woman whose dreams have been shattered, whose university aspirations have been reduced to finding sanitary pads, a drop of water or a morsel of food. The girl or boy whose legs have been amputated, disfigured, mutilated, disabled, the elderly woman deprived of medication for diabetes or kidney dialysis or breast cancer, suffering an unknown fate. The young woman detained by the occupying forces, intimidated, beaten, tortured, threatened with sexual violence, held in captivity indefinitely. The women and children left under the rubble, denied dignity even in death. Think of the children deprived of education, their schools gone, their friends gone. The widow living in a makeshift tent, not knowing how she will sustain her family. The grandmother who waited for generations to return, only to be forcibly displaced again. The child who is suddenly a caregiver for her little sisters and brothers, both mother and father killed the children with no surviving family at all, left completely alone in this world. We implore you to think of the lives torn apart, the homes and communities destroyed, the families devastated, some killed in their entirety. A society is being shredded to pieces, conditions of life destroyed in a war of collective punishment, a war of genocide. Think of their exhaustion, their fear and despair of the scars, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, that no aid truck can alleviate. There can be no excuse not to demand an immediate ceasefire. It is the only way to protect human lives and ensure their sustenance and survival. Only then can we work to ensure 
the true healing and recovery of the women and children and all victims in Gaza and to ensure the justice that they deserve. I thank you, Mr. Chair, and I look forward to the presentations by our panelists. Thank you very much, Excellency. You have just made a very uh, sad depiction of a very heartbreaking, heart-wrenching situation, a situation where dehumanization and cruelty reign, reign supreme. And thank you for framing the issue of our event. Let me now give the floor to our four panelists who will cover different aspects of the impact of the war on Gaza. We will hear from UNRWA, from UNFPA. We will also hear personal stories from Gaza and a report from Save the Children International. Our first speaker, Mrs. Heli Usikila, is the Senior Deputy Director of UNRWA Affairs in Gaza since October 2023. Previously, she was the Deputy Director in OSHA Operations and Advocacy Division in New York and the Acting Director of Humanitarian Financing from 2021 to 2022. And over the last 23 years, she has held numerous operations and programs management and leadership positions with UNRWA, UNDP, WFP, and OCHA in several countries, including Syria, Gaza, Somalia, Kenya, Bangladesh, Jordan, Lebanon, Pakistan, South Sudan, and in Syria. Mrs. Usikila, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, distinguished chair, uh, J.T. Young, and uh, and, and, and uh, excellency, uh, Ambassador uh, Abdul Hadi, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for having us uh, uh, in this uh, uh, panel today. And um, I am connecting, and I'm calling uh, uh, from Gaza, uh, from Rafa, and uh, you can see maybe from my background that. Uh, picture from the logistics base uh, uh, from uh, uh, UNRWA uh, RAFA operations, uh, 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 which is uh, uh, surrounded by uh, thousands, tens of thousands of uh, 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 IDPs. Uh, they make the shift and uh, temporary accommodations. And uh, I'm presently in uh, Tal Sultan uh, Health Center in RAFA. And if I'm looking out from my window as we speak, uh, uh, there are thousands and thousands of people everywhere looking for safe place and um, and the uh, end of the uh, conflict and seeking for uh, assistance. Uh, today, uh, uh, I will, uh, as uh, 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 the chair mentioned, I will we will be covering different uh, aspects of the. Uh, uh, war, uh, war on Gaza impact on Palestinian women and children, and I will be talking about humanitarian impact of the conflict in Gaza on uh, vulnerable uh, population and highlighting some uh, key uh, uh, issues. Uh, just a few hours ago, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I'm based in the uh, health center in Rafa. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet with Noor. Noor is a young mother uh, of six children, and the youngest one being one and a half years, uh, uh, one and a half months old. The child was uh, 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 Noor was unable to uh, feed and bath the child, and hardly provide uh, 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 food, and therefore seeking for dignity, assistance, and safe place uh, to be. Uh, we have seen. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Noors uh, every day, and uh, UNRWA and our humanitarian partners, we do everything best in our capacity uh, to support them and support the mothers looking for vaccination, looking for food, looking for medical assistance and support to the increasingly malnourished children. Uh, today I will focus on the impact of the war on the most vulnerable population, those who are the least resilient and most at risk. First and most obvious is the collapse of basic protection for civilians. The majority of those killed and injured are civilians. Today, over 31,000 civilians have been killed. Of those, 
72% are women, children. 63 uh, women are killed average every day and two mothers on average every hour, according to UN Women. Homes and civilian infrastructure critical to sustaining life in Gaza have been destroyed. While 1.7 million people has been personally displaced many multiple times. Nor, I mentioned earlier, young mother I met a few hours ago, she has been displaced three times. She came from North, she was in Gaza, she was in Khan Yunus, and now she is in Rafa, a looking safe place. Uh, people are displaced, uh, displaced multiple times and to the areas that lack essential for human survival, including food, water, shelter, and infrastructure. Mental reason is now accelerating at alarming pace due to lack of food, water, and health services. According to the Ministry of Health in Gaza, the death toll for malnutrition and dehydration in northern Gaza has risen to 25 people, including 21 children. And these are only the hospitalized cases. People go days without eating. Over 1 million Gazans face emergency level of food insecurity and 500,000 catastrophic level of food insecurity. 350,000 children under five years uh, in Gaza are especially vulnerable, where an estimated 155,000 pregnant and breastfeeding women are at a high risk of malnutrition. Uh, malnutrition. Malnourished mothers have malnourished babies. Nor, I met earlier today, uh, she had to discontinue breastfeeding because she's too malnourished uh, uh, to continue. The second challenge uh, is the impact of our overcrowded living conditions in Gaza. Overcrowding has exacerbated unhygienic living conditions and the risk of communicable diseases. Cases of hepatitis I, A are increasing. We are currently monitoring the spread of 11 different infectious diseases in our shelters. Water and sanitation. 61% of the collective shelters do not have showers, while only 24% of the showers have several showers for men and women. Men and women. Overcrowding in under shelters, which were designed for much less uh, 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 people uh, for emergency purposes. At the present level, there are 888 people, persons for one toilet, and 5,400 persons for one shower room. We can all imagine and understand the impact and the level of uh, hygiene crisis. Overcrowded conditions are also stripping IDPs of their dignity. Nor, she told me today, She's been going around to find dignifying and find suitable shelter for her and for her sick children, and so far have not found a place. Unavailability of latrine units forces families to resort uh, uh, to unhygienic methods such as making a toilet facility inside and outside of tents. And there are not enough hygiene kits for women, girls, and families. Elderly persons and persons with disabilities are forced to wear adult diapers in absence of adequate toilet in days and uh, stripping their uh, dignity. Overcrowding in makeshift shelters is also compromising women's and girls' safety, contributing to increased domestic violence, while the breakdown of public order and social structures increase the risk of gender-based violence, violence without any functioning referral pathways and uh, very few support services for GBV survivors. The war has also caused major disruption in health service delivery. Around 350,000 residents with chronic uh, diseases have limited access to their medications and essential medical procedures for dialysis. Pregnant women face elevated risk during pregnancy and post-delivery because of limited access to nutrition, hygiene, and obsessive services. And I know that my colleagues and other panel members will be also discussing the detail. Women are increasingly giving birth in shelters. The impact of these and other challenges is particularly devastating on children. 625,000 children in Gaza are without access to education, robbing them of the opportunities and protections education brings. 
Children are ill-equipped to deal with the mental health impacts of displacement and exposure to extreme violence. They have uh, provided support uh, for other activities, mental health and psychosocial support and, uh, and recreation activities uh, uh, for children, but much more is needed. Particularly vulnerable are accompanied and separated children. It is estimated that there are now 17,000 children who are unaccompanied or separated from their parents, and at least 10,000 children who have lost at least one parent. Family reunification efforts continue to be hindered by frequent communications, blackouts, and ongoing displacements. The board has also said that they have the persons with disabilities who have lost support structures, caregivers, and access to rehabilitation services and assistive devices. Serious injury and minimum access, minimal access to medical and uh, rehabilitative services have increased the risk of permanent disability. The picture of Gaza is extremely grim. UNRWA continues to play a major and uh, vital role in overall humanitarian architecture in what are incredibly, in, uh, incredibly challenging uh, circumstances. This includes leading on the cross border aid operation, providing shelter and basic services to millions in Gaza and UNRWA installations, and providing uh, air primary healthcare services inside and outside the uh, UNRWA managed shelters. Uh, in the present level, when the uh, uh, medical and primary health care needs are just increasing, uh, uh, our UNRWA doctors, my colleagues, uh, 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 medical doctors, they are seeing an average of 120 patients a day, and the numbers are just uh, uh, increasing. In terms of vulnerability, responsive engagements, in addition to ensuring inclusion of women and girls' needs and provision of aid, UNRWA staff are continuing to provide GPD services, uh, yet much less and the need uh, uh, would be there. And uh, uh, this includes uh, uh, psychological first aid or survivors, psychosocial support, social work interventions, uh, and child protection. Notwithstanding all these efforts, only a full and immediate uh, uh, humanitarian ceasefire can provide proper protection for civilians. Civilians and civilian objects must be protected at all times. To save lives, disease must be lifted, basic services restored, and vital supplies reinstated. Border crossings open to allow timely and sufficient levels of aid. Humanitarian access facilitated through cars to raise all civilians in need in a rapid, safe, unimpeded, and sustainable manner. This must happen now. Thank you. Uh, this is a uh, particular thank you, first of all, for being there, for being in Gaza, and thank you for sharing UNRWA's uh, update on the humanitarian situation of vulnerable groups in, in Gaza. Let me also express on behalf of the committee our unwavering support for the life-saving work the agency is carrying out for over 5 million Palestinian refugees in the OPT and across the region. Thank you once again. We now turn to, to uh, Mrs. Uh, Laila Baker, Regional Director for Arab States at the UN FPA. Mrs. Baker has 30 years of international experience in global humanitarian and development settings, primarily in uh, global, uh, primarily in the Arab region, uh, leading and strategizing program delivery, resource mobilization, and interagency coordination in complex geopolitical uh, situations. Prior to UNFPA, Mrs. Baker came, comes from a long history of service within the UN, most notably UNDP, UNRWA, as well as uh, NGOs such as Planned Parenthood, Oxfam UK, and the International Federation of the Red Cross, uh, in Palestine, a national of the U.S., of the United States of America, and of Palestinian descent, she is strongly committed to seeing through the achievement of UNFPA, three goals of ending preventable maternal death, advancing family planning, and ending gender-based violence in the Arab region by 2030. Due to previous engagements, Mrs. Baker will have to leave us at 11, so she won't be able to participate in the key and Q&A session. 
Mrs. Baker, you have the floor. Ambassador Yang, uh, Ambassador Akinhebi, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my heart's broken. It's very difficult for me to be here today. I am a woman, Palestinian American, a UN professional who has worked her entire adult life in the hope and conviction that peace and prosperity is built on the premise of justice and egalitarian human values. You've heard from the two speakers before me and Ambassador Nyang, and I could give you all of the statistics in the world, 2.2 million Palestinians in Gaza in the midst of an epic humanitarian catastrophe facing inhumane conditions that you've heard. 150,000 pregnant women who, and breastfeeding women who can't meet their daily caloric intake or water. I can tell you that the statistics for malnutrition of under twos has risen from less than 1% before October 7th to 15%, an unprecedented amount of wasting in children that we have never seen in the modern history since the UN was established. To do so would be to capture only a fragment of the injustice and the suffering of the people of Gaza and people of Palestine. Hunger is a de deadly threat at the moment. Every day is a fight for survival and more than half a million people are one step, one step away from famine. In a society where famine was unheard of, where malnutrition was nearly at zero. And that is despite the conditions of blockade of Israeli occupation and continual deprivation of that community for 17 years of blockade and of 56 years of occupation. Picture all of that now. Okay. Picture it now. Yes, it's okay. Ambassador Niang, I believe you're- Yes, we can, we can hear you. You can carry on. It's okay. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm, I'm struggling with my... Uh, with, <laughs> okay. I could tell you about the tens of thousands of pregnant women who are currently in Gaza. 180 of whom give birth every day. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of those statistics and what it has meant at the moment with the many of, with the infrastructure that has been so badly damaged. But more than anything, I want you to picture, trying to picture for a moment, what it's like to be a woman or a girl in Gaza. Think back to the first child who came into your life, whether that was your own or a loved one who brought a baby into this world and where it should be a moment of anticipation, surely, some anxiety, but overwhelming joy. Now picture that same person trying to get through to what is only two of 36 remaining hospitals that are either I'm, are only semi-functioning. And where if you're lucky enough to get there as a pregnant woman, you may or may not find a doctor who isn't exhausted after five and a half months of conflict of working at two to 300% capacity and where basic hygiene, space, medications and supplies are nearly exhausted. Think then to the professional who has to look at this poor woman and decide whether or not she has to undergo a cesarean section with limited or no anesthesia. I think the hell and the dilemma that it poses ethically for the mother, for her family, for the health professionals, and for all of us who are in the United Nations and who aspire to any humanitarian values this is a testament and a test of our own integrity. 
we know that much of Gaza's population has already been displaced into a small corner of what was already one of the most crowded areas on earth. And despite those insurmountable circumstances, I want to just to juxtapose a few of the a, a few of the statistics to give you an idea about the depth and scope of both the destruction of the infrastructure and the social fabric that is also impacting women and girls even more negatively than many of the rest of the population. In an area that was one of the most overcrowded, we now have 1.9 million people corralled into one small corner of Rafah. There is no area on the planet that has that population density. People alone who are in, the, in that area are subject to all of the things that you heard my colleague from UNRWA describe. Disease, inability to deal with waste management, that's if you're lucky enough to find food and water and a tent to cover your head. For the 80% of the displaced population who are women, girls, and other young people, the additional burden often comes because women have been socialized throughout history and certainly in the Palestinian community to be the caretakers of their families and their communities. A woman will put her children, her family, oftentimes her neighbors, her elderly parents, her elderly in-laws, others that she, who need service first. If water, privacy, food, medication, shelter are in short supply, you can guarantee that she's going to put everyone ahead of her. And in a situation where privacy is already scarce, and an average of one toilet available for every 340 people on average, and where it can reach over 1,200 people. Imagine that you are a young girl just coming into adolescence and finding your own feet into your newfound womanhood and unable to deal with your own menstrual hygiene and other care. Oftentimes, these things are overlooked because they're considered private matters, but I wonder what privacy there is in a situation where none exists. And to our sister agency, UNRWA, who provided not only the care and protection for the majority of Palestinians in Gaza, there is also a relentless and unjustified and unjust attack on them. UNFPA and many of the other UN agencies depend on UNRWA for its services. Without them, we feel that the world cannot just that we cannot serve the Palestinian people, not now and not for the long run. And we, we urge everyone in this community to take note of that. I could go on and on, but let me end on a few things that I would like for us to focus on as we go forward and we try and protect the integrity and the well being of mothers and girls as part of the social fabric in Gaza. UNFPA is one agency, but we work tirelessly with many of our partners. And I must admit that this is one of the few crises where our partners are also part of the displaced, part of the people who are attacked, part of the people who are at a loss, which means that it's very difficult for us to find a platform where we can do more than just relief for all the issues that have to do with safe delivery that we have protected fiercely and where we have had absolutely wonderful outcomes there was very little maternal death, almost no, no neonatal death in Gaza prior to October 7th. All of that has been turned to dust. So we are trying desperately, first and foremost, that we are trying to get the much needed relief for those who have been working tirelessly the last five and a half months and in accordance with the order of the International Court of Justice and the provisional measures first and foremost, that call for the safe delivery of humanitarian aid. Our workers cannot go in and be part of that structure and provide and give relief to the people who are there if they are unsafe themselves. We tried to reach out to at least the women and children who are in the most dire predicaments to provide them with water, with hygiene products, and with medical supplies that are in, in very short 
uh, supply and high demand and to provide some of the medical care that we can, can relieve the overtired and exhausted health professionals. We've deployed teams there, but it's not enough. And so as we go forward, we reiterate both the emergency relief coordinators call that the in, in relationship to the entire population of Gaza being the victims of an assault that are unparalleled in its intensity, brutality, and scope. And the only way to address that is to call for an immediate ceasefire, not a pause, not anything that would not be lasting, and one that would allow for the life-saving services to the three quarters of Gaza's population who now reside in the small corner to be met through UNRWA, through our sister agencies, through the other relief um, partners that we work with. We also call on the international community to be in compliance with international humanitarian law and the protection of all civilians. Women make up the majority, but they are not the entirety of the population. And we, will, we, we call on everyone to be protected equally. And last but not least, it is the hospital personnel and medical people who are there, who can facilitate safe birth, including where there is an obstetric, um, vulnerability, providing clean water, hygiene, and restoring the market so that people will access their own care. We believe in the agency of people. And we would also like that as we go forward, and this is a, this is a conversation about women's role, not as victims as well, but as agents of their own, their own destiny and change. We work hand in hand with all of the women who are here and all of the well-meaning men, Ambassador Niang, you are amongst the top of them. But we hope that we can bring more women into the fold around humanitarian diplomacy, being the navigators of a very complex conversation that is less polarized, less militarized. And we hope that we can turn people who have been reduced to aid recipients to really being the change makers that will allow the people of Palestine to live as human beings are meant to live in dignity and good health with a just and peaceful solution to all of our inalienable rights. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Baker, uh, I would like to thank you very much for your presentation. I think your role within the UNFPA puts you in a unique position to apprehend uh, most accurately, the tragic fate of uh, women and children of Gaza. Uh, you are facing horror every day, and we understand we understand very well the emotion that runs through your well documented uh, documented presentation. Uh, we appreciated your relevant information about the representing impact on women and newborns during this conflict. Thank you once again. Our third speaker is uh, Dr. Rola El Fara, a U.S. Palestinian physician from Gaza. She is currently the director of the Center for Health and Biosciences at Rice University's Baker U Institute for Public Policy, and she is an assistant professor at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. She is an expert on women's health and global and national health care policy with 26 years experience as practicing physician. Dr. El Farah's father was born in Khan Yunis in the southern Gaza Strip. And uh, I'm very sorry to say that since the summers of October, over 100 members of El Farah's family have been killed. Please accept our heartfelt condolences. Uh, Dr. Rohail Farah has been in uh, regular contact with family members in Gaza, and she's here to tell us their story. Thank you, Ambassador Nying and Ambassador Abed Hadi, um, for this opportunity to share the voices of my family members. Um, and I would also like to extend my deep appreciation to the other members of our panel for the very important work that you are doing to help my family members in Gaza and, and the people of Gaza. My name is uh, Dr. Rolal Farah. I am a Palestinian American physician in Houston. 
Texas, I have expertise in women's health and health policy. My father, as you mentioned, was born in Khan Yunus and my mother in Gaza City. And um, the Alfreda family actually is one of the largest families in Khan Yunus with over 12,000 family members there and thousands more around the world. We have lived in Gaza for centuries. We are the indigenous people of the land there. My goal today is to share with you the devastating and horrific impact of Israel's war on Gaza on the women and children in my family from the perspective of a physician, a woman, a mother, and a Palestinian in order to give real context and meaning to today's discussion. The stories that I share with you are tragic and deeply personal, but they need to be heard in order to understand the magnitude of suffering, trauma, and terror that my family members have experienced. Since the 7th of October, actually now over 150 family members, since I wrote that bio sketch, it's now 150 family members, have been murdered by Israel's assault on Gaza, by Israeli bombardment, by sniper fire, and by the denial of humanitarian aid, including food, water, electricity, shelter, and medical care. It is imperative to understand the historical context of this brutal war as well. My family has endured a 50-year violent occupation by Israel and a blockade that has forced them to live in an open-air prison in conditions that were already designated as a humanitarian disaster. In other words, the women and the children in my family have already experienced significant trauma and brutality prior to October of 2023. The plight of women and children in Gaza and in my family, in the Farah family, is nothing short of humanitarian catastrophe. Of the 150 family members killed, over 90 were women and children. Many women have been wid widowed, many children have been orphaned, Virtually all women and children in my family have been displaced to the South due to the destruction of their homes. The women and children in my family have endured massacres of entire nuclear multi-generational families by Israeli airstrikes of their homes. If you could please, uh, I think Ambassador, you have control of the slides. Could you please move forward one more slide, please? I'm going to share some pictures with you. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in late October, uh, in October, my cousin Jamal al-Farah and his wife Nihad were sheltering with their entire family uh, when an Israeli strike destroyed their home. Nihad survived, but she witnessed the death of her son Tawfiq, and, uh, who was a dentist, and his pregnant wife Dana, and their two beautiful daughters Reem and Hala. Her granddaughter Reem's wedding actually had been planned for the day that they were murdered. Nihad also witnessed the death of her brother-in-law, Isam, along with his wife Samad, and their three daughters, Rasul, Tukha, and Nadian. And so his entire family was wiped from the civil registry. And had suffered traumatic injuries and had to endure the amp amputation of her limb in addition to witnessing the death of her family. So here I share some pictures of the extended family as well as one of their daughters, Nahan, and Dina, the wife of Tofik, who was pregnant when she was killed. Next slide, please. Children in my family have endured the murder of their parents and horrific injuries from their massacres as well. In late October, 2023, an Israeli airstrike hit the home of my father's first cousin, Aziz, who's pictured there along with his children um, and his brother, Hatim, and his brother-in-law, along with their wives uh, and children. They were sheltering together in one home and tragically massacred at night while asleep. The three fathers were killed along with 14 other members of the family, including seven of their children and their three wives. Next slide, please. This is a picture of 10-year-old Hamza. On the left, you see a picture of him with his two younger siblings who were, who were killed in the, mass the massacre. Hamza survived the massacre, but he sustained critical injuries and he was taken to a nearby hospital when he underwent surgery. This is his picture in the hospital that was posted by other family members. And they had written that he had spent the remaining hours of his life in agony. He cried out incessantly for his deceased family and endured horrific pain due to the shortage of pain medications. He died a few days later, alone and in agony. I think about him often. There really is no circumstance in this world that can justify the immeasurable suffering of this innocent child. Next slide, please. Six-year-old Sena al farah was also murdered. Um, if you could go ahead to the next slide. Sorry about that. Here's a picture of six-year-old Sena al farah who was murdered in her home along with family members. A picture of beautiful Sena wearing a Disney princess dress 
next to a picture of her dead body went viral on social media. Her photo captures the beauty and the innocence of children, but by virtue of being a Palestinian child in Gaza, she was not offered the same protection from war crimes that other children in the West are. Next slide, please. Women and children in my family have endured relentless indiscriminate bombing that has destroyed virtually all of their homes, forcibly displacing them to evacuation camps in the South where they live in catastrophic conditions with no access to clean water, food, electricity, and medical care. I would like to share the tragic story of Iman al farra the pregnant mother of nine young children. On December 17th, 2023, her husband, Sabri Abdullah al farra was murdered in his home by an Israeli airstrike along with her nine children. They were buried under the rubble of their home for several days before anyone could recover them. Iman survived and she was forced to evacuate to a camp in Rafah. She gave birth to a baby boy with no access to clean water, electricity, and medical care. Her newborn son died 20 days later on January 28th from the cold and the harsh conditions in the camp. In what world is it acceptable for a pregnant mother to endure so much pain, loss, and tragedy? Humanity has indeed failed the women and children of Gaza. Women in my family like Iman and across Gaza have been subject, subjected to either a complete lack of or inadequate reproductive health care. My first cousin posted on Facebook that her neighbor down the street had just given birth on the rubble of her destroyed home, asking if anyone in the area could help provide her with clothing and supplies for the newborn infant. My first cousin in California is in regular contact with her sisters in Gaza, who have reported that they have not had feminine hygiene products since the beginning of the Israeli attack on Gaza increasing the risk of reproductive and urinary tra tract infections in young women. Women and children of my family have also been denied access to the most basic of humanitarian needs by the state of Israel. One family member texted, we have been sleeping without food for 24 hours at a time. We have not seen flour, meat, vegetables, or fruits for three months now. They are using animal feed to make bread and recycling water. My first cousin, Muna, sent a picture of her two and four-year-old daughters just last week. It was heartbreaking to see that her daughters were wasted and cachectic, which are medical signs for severe malnutrition. They have been surviving on canned beans and eat one meal per day, if at all any meals. Water contamination has caused severe gastrointestinal illnesses with an entire family recently suffering from hepatitis A infection, women and children included. Many of our family members have died due to an inability to access critical medical care. Here's a picture of 12-year-old Abdul Rahim al farra He was walking to the only restroom available in his evacuation camp when he was injured by an Israeli missile. He died en route because there was no functional hospital. He was en route in an ambulance. There was no functional hospital nearby, enough to save him in time. Next picture. This is Dr. Samar Riyad al farra She is a young, healthy woman in her 20s who had just finished her post-doctorate. Um, she completed her post-doctorate. She died in the evacuation camps in Rafah from a respiratory infection when her health deteriorated suddenly and she was unable to obtain medical treatment. My cousin, 30-year-old Salma al farra with chronic kidney disease who was dialysis dependent died because she could not access her dialysis treatments. As a physician, I am particularly appalled. Uh, next picture, please. I wanted to share with you this, this slide. This is a picture of Salman Farra, who died because she couldn't access her dialysis treatments. As a physician, I am particularly appalled by the loss of life from medical conditions that could have been in any other circumstances readily treatable. In the Western world, this would constitute the standard of care and anything less would be considered unacceptable. Finally, next slide, please. The women and children in my family continue to be subjected to the most severe and unimaginable psychological and emotional trauma. They are literally, they are literally waiting to die, living in an endless state of terror and despair. The following is a text sent to a cousin of mine in Virginia by his cousin in Northern Hudson. He wrote, horror, horror, we were bombed in all forms and even with all of our experience with years of being bombed, this was new. All we could do was just pray continuously until morning. And for all of our attempts to shelter the kids, they were crying and afraid all night. There are also multiple stories from family fleeing at the orders of the Israeli military from the north to south that convey pure terror. 
one family member texted, quote, we tried to flee to the southern part of Gaza as the Israeli military was forcing us to do so, but we couldn't even do that. The situation is very difficult with thousands of people attempting to flee. Overcrowding roads and intersections, women, children, and the elderly are carrying the little they could carry and walking up to 20 miles before reaching the southern parts of Gaza. Parents have posted names and pictures of children that they have been separated from, asking for assistance in locating them. And here I show some social media pictures on the left, list of names in our family of children who have se been separated from their parents, asking if anybody could find them and help locate them. And on the right is a picture of a disabled child who has been lost by their parents and asking for help, assistance in locating this child. What, next slide, please. Women and children have witnessed brutal massacres of their loved ones and horrific injuries all around them. One cousin reported that his brother went and had to witness our own mother with half of her body buried under the rubble and his sister Wafat shredded into pieces. Mothers in our family have watched the murder of all of their children and children have become orphans after witnessing the murder of their parents. Here are a few posts, a few pictures of babies who, uh, whose pictures have been posted because um, they have been killed by massacres and their parents um, have lost their children. Next slide, please. Here's um, a picture of two children. Parents in our family lost their only two children and posted their pictures. Next slide, please. My first cousin, Dr. Muna al Farra, pictured here on the left. She is a dentist and the mother of three young children. She was widowed in October when her husband was killed in an Israeli missile strike on his car while driving to check on his parents because he hadn't heard from them. Her social media posts have provided a window into her intense pain and suffering. Next slide, please. She has written several, I've shared a slide here, but I'm gonna read one of her posts. She writes, it's not goodbye, my love. A farewell is not suitable for us because you are alive with me every moment. And I am a believer. I swear that I am waiting to meet you as if it were a little while. No, no, please, no, don't say goodbye. Next slide, please. Her eight-year-old daughter, Hasna, wrote a heart-wrenching letter to her father stating, quote, my dad is the greatest dad. I will still tell you all of my secrets, daddy. I miss you, my mom, my brother, and my little sister miss you, and we will never forget you. Mothers and fathers in our family are experiencing profound distress as they are unable to help their children who are crying from hunger and thirst, nor are they able to protect their children from the dangers of Israeli aggression. Women and children are psychologically exhausted. Coping mechanisms have been eroded. Next slide, please. My, cousin, my first cousin posts regularly on social media about her psychological devastation. Here's a quote from her. No one asks for aid to Gaza. We need to stand up for the war. While we are losing the people, we are not a game. This, we are not a game between you. We are human beings. Have mercy on us, O oh world. We have no mercy on us. Every hour we lose, some, we lose someone dear to us, our lands and houses. The disease is a form. We do not need aid to buy from the market. We do not need to go down for aid and we need someone to treat us. The diseases have increased. Don't talk only about the broken hearts of people. I swear we are dying. Given the severity of the war crimes committed against them, my family will be plagued for generations to come, not only with physical scars or lost limbs, of the survivors, but also deep-seated psychological wounds, including PTSD, depression, suicide, and profound disability. The entire fabric of my family's life in Gaza has been brutally dismantled by Israel's demolition of Gaza, including the complete destruction of their educational, healthcare, and legal systems. Almost all schools and universities have been completely decimated. My heart was broken when I heard that my first cousin's eight-year-old niece recently asked her aunt who lives in California if she could please send her some crayons from the United States because all of her school supplies were struck, were stuck under the rubble of her destroyed home. All education of children and young adults has ceased, profoundly impairing the mental, developmental, and psychological well-being of all children of Gaza. The future implications of this complete annihilation of our social infrastructure, education in particular by Israel, unfortunately will haunt generations of lessons to come. Tragically, these stories are only a glimpse into the horror and the devastation that has been inflicted upon the Al-Farah family over the last five months by Israeli aggression. 
the lives of women and children in my family have been completely shattered with profound and devastating consequences on their safety, psychological well-being, general and reproductive health, food security, education, and family structures. I will start stop there. Thank you. Dr. Rola El Fara, you have just made an overwhelming presentation, documented and supported by uh, terrible pictures and images, and also very uh, moving texts uh, from uh, the people who were who who died and who are very your your family members. This presentation is is very real because it's dealing with the flesh and blood people. And that, that the people are your, your your family members, and really your story is a chilling tale of cruelty. Uh, I thank you for your compelling personal perspective on the war in Gaza, and it's significant for your family and for Palestinians. And please extend to the whole family our heartfelt condolences. Finally, let me. Yeah, let me now introduce uh, Mrs. Alexandra Saye, Head of uh, Humanitarian Policy and Advocacy mm -hmm. at Save the Children's International, a renowned NGO. Mrs. Saye is based in Washington, D.C. For more than a decade, uh, she has worked for leading humanitarian organizations addressing some of the most challenging humanitarian and displacement crises across the Middle East and North Africa region, including Jordan, Iraq, mm -hmm. Lebanon, Libya, Syria, Lebanon, uh, already. Yeah. Okay, Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, Libya, Syria, and the OPT. Her expertise lies in humanitarian and conflict issues, including displacement, uh, migration, humanitarian access, protection of civilians in post conflict recovery context. Mrs. Sayer, you have the floor. Thank you so much, and thank you for this opportunity to talk about the unfolding child rights crisis in, in Gaza and the wider occupied Palestinian territory. Um, I will, uh, it's difficult to, to, to follow after Dr. Rilla's um, incredibly moving presentation, um, but I'll try to give um, a little bit more information from of what we're seeing on the ground in Gaza. Um, Save the Children um, as an organization works in 116 countries around the world, and we've been supporting Palestinian children in the region since 1953. And we've had a consistent presence in the occupied Palestinian territory since 1973, including um, the Gaza Strip. This has been the deadliest year on record for Palestinian children in Gaza and the West Bank. And even before October 2023, we had warned that it was the deadliest year for children um, in the West Bank specifically. And now, um, nearly six mm -hmm. months into the crisis in Gaza, the scale and pace of grave violations committed against children in Gaza is unlike anything we have seen before. These grave violations include the killing and maiming of Palestinian children. And as of yesterday, the uh, Palestinian Ministry of Health had recorded at least 13,450 children killed in Gaza, making up just under half of the people killed in Gaza. And we know that thousands are still missing, presumed buried under the rubble, their deaths unmarked. We know that more than a hundred other Palestinian children in the West Bank have also been been killed um, over the past uh, five to six months. Countless uh, children have have been maimed and lost their limbs due to Israel's use of explosive weapons in densely populated areas. And Save the Children has estimated that at least ten children per day are losing one or both of their limbs in Gaza. We've seen their bodies suffer burns. They've been killed and crushed by falling rubble and by preventable diseases. And it's important to emphasize that children who are now faced with life altering injuries are unable to access the most basic treatment or pain management due to the decimation of the health system in Gaza. We have also seen attacks on schools and hospitals and 
to be honest, the destruction of schools and hospitals in Gaza has now become the norm, not the exception. No child in Gaza is going to school. And even if there was a ceasefire tomorrow, we would be unable to just resume uh, schooling in Gaza due to the fact that more than 370 schools are either destroyed or too damaged to function, and the rest are housing displaced uh, people. Um, there is no func fully functional hospital in Gaza. And 75% of primary health facilities are no longer functioning. Um, and children who are having to undergo amputations are having this done without anesthetics, experiencing excruciating pain. We have also seen abductions. Um, and uh, we've seen also in the last uh, six months a rising number of children uh, detained without charge in Israeli in the Israeli military system, reportedly facing um, violence and abuse, including sexual abuse, um, sexual violence. Um, we've also seen a systematic uh, denial of humanitarian access. And over the last six weeks, we've actually seen a drop in the amount of um, humanitarian assistance entering Gaza from um, either of the uh, crossing points uh, that have been um, made available for the um, entry of, of, of humanitarian assistance. And we know that there is a direct correlation between the amount and the ability to distribute humanitarian aid and the uh, what we're seeing now, which is children and adults dying from malnutri malnutrition and dehydration. And we know that if the status quo continues, um, if uh, Israeli bombardment and restrictions on the type and the amount of assistance that is entering Gaza continues, we will see an explosion of pre preventable child deaths. Um we, at least 21 children have now died of malnutrition and dehydration. And we believe that this is um, likely the tip of the iceberg. These are children who made it to hospitals and, and health facilities um, and have had uh, these deaths recorded. Um, but due to the fact that um, Telecoms in Gaza is uh, is is uh, is not reliable, and that hospitals are overwhelmed by mostly trauma cases. We believe that the figure is likely um, much higher. We have seen essential items that are critical to respond to hu the humanitarian needs of children be denied access, be denied um, entry into Gaza by um, as a result of Israeli inspections. So this has included. Items such as insulin pens, scalpels, and water purification devices. These are essential for the delivery of aid in Gaza. Um, all uh, 1.1 million children in Gaza face uh, the risk of famine and the risk of death by starvation and disease, as aid delivery is almost impossible to carry out. Um, one in six children in northern Gaza is now acutely malnourished, and northern Gaza is the area that has been almost completely cut off from humanitarian assistance, and we've seen multiple convoys um, of aid over the last few months be denied entry. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what um, severe malnutrition does to children. Um and in particular, uh, what we call child wasting. Um, child wasting is the most is the deadliest form of of um, severe malnutrition, and it requires immediate medical uh, treatment in order to prevent uh, children from dying. And we know that hospitals in Gaza do not have the capacity to provide this sort of uh, treatment because they're either they've been attacked or um, or are overwhelmed with trauma cases. Um, acute malnutrition weakens the immune system of children. It 
they, their muscles waste away and they are at risk of dying from um, common childhood diseases, including uh, diarrhea and pneumonia because their bodies cannot withstand um, uh, these diseases. And so, you know, the, the malnutrition really compounds uh, the impact of, of other diseases. We also know from our experience that um, acute malnutrition also uh, causes lifelong growth and development ch challenges, um, including learning challenges and stunting. And so the starvation that we're seeing today will have a long-term impact on the future of Palestinian children. And I think that's important to, to, to um, emphasize. Um, 70% of children in Gaza, um, excuse me, 70% of children under five in Gaza have experienced diarrhea within the last few weeks. And diarrhea can be deadly um, when children are malnourished. Um, at least 90% of children in Gaza, on, um, children under five in Gaza right now are experiencing some sort of disease. So I, um, and, and again, with the uh, compounding effects of malnutrition, this is, these are a deadly, um, uh, dead, this will have a deadly impact. Um, my colleagues in Gaza have said that their families, um, have had to resort to children, um, uh, eating animal feed just to survive. Um, and we've also heard reports that this is now running out in parts of Northern Gaza. Um, according to the uh, nutrition cluster, 3% of children in northern Gaza are facing uh, child wasting. And we know that as the situation continues, this is bound to get um, much worse. I want to also emphasize that humanitarian organizations have been sounding the alarm on this for months. We have warned that if the status quo continues, if we are unable to provide the assistance needed, if there is a continued continued bombardment, we were we would we would see the the kind of the scenario that we're we're seeing right now unfold. Um, I also you know we don't talk about the mental health impact on children very much, um, but what we have seen um, and what our experts and um, our mental health experts and child protection experts have seen is that um, the conditions in Gaza currently represent textbook risk factors for lasting mental harm in for children in Gaza. And Save the Children has been looking at uh, the mental harm of children in Gaza now for many years. In 2022, um, so before this uh, most recent escalation, we found that more than half of children in Gaza were contemplating self-harm. Four out of five children in Gaza were suffering from depression and had no hope for the future. And over the last, um, actually over the last couple of weeks, we have... Um, looked into, we, we've talked to caregivers, parents, and mental health experts who are um, who are in Gaza to look at how the last few months has impacted children. And one mother said to us, one mother of four children said to us, I wouldn't even say that their mental health has deteriorated. It's been obliterated. Complete psychological destruction is what is what she described as the mental health um, of children in Gaza. Um, after five months of violence, displacement, starvation, and disease, and a, a military blockade, we've seen relentless uh, mental harm to children in Gaza. And parents and caregivers have, have told us that children's capacity to even imagine a future without war has virtually disappeared. Um, over the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, based on our um, our interviews with uh, mental health experts and 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 parents in Gaza, we uh, 
we, we documented reports of uh, children facing uh, symptoms of severe emotional distress and trauma, such as fear, anxiety, uh, disordered eating, bedwetting, hypervigilance, and sleeping problems. We've also seen behavioral changes um, that have been reported, including introversion, separation anxiety, um, or changes in attachment styles from parents, and even um, regression. Children re were reporting to their parents that they were constantly fearful of their own death, as well as their parents' death, deaths. Parents noted that their children now have curtailed dreams and aspirations, and um, their children don't see a future for themselves and are simply focused on their own survival. Um, I want to also share a quote from you um, that we that we have from um, a father um, in Gaza. Um, he said, my children ask me, Daddy, when can we go home? I have to tell them that our house was destroyed, that it's gone. They start crying and I comfort them by telling them that I'll get them another one. But what can I say? I can't see a life for them anymore or future. Life is so difficult for them now. We live in a small place. They cannot breathe. The streets are full of children. The whole of Gaza is in Rafa now. People are stacked on top of one another. Sometimes I try to make uh, take my children for a short walk and all they do is cry. What can we do? And with that, I want to also um, warn that any sort of expansion uh, and, gr uh, and gr uh, ground incursion into Rafa would be an absolute catastrophe for children. The majority of Gaza's children now are now trapped in Rafa. What, more than 1.3, 1.4 million people, 610,000 of them are children. If there is an expansion in Rafa, we will see mass civilian casualties and the possible collapse of any semblance of a humanitarian response in Gaza. Um, I, I want to end with um, a few recommendations. Um, for, you know, what children need right now is an end uh, to, to the bombardment. So we're calling on an immediate and sustainable and definitive ceasefire and for all governments to put their weight behind a ceasefire. We're also calling on governments to stop the transfer of weapons where there is evidenced risk that they can be used to commit international crimes. We're also calling on for unrestricted humanitarian access um, and the resumption of commercial goods entering Gaza. Humanitarian assistance in Gaza has become a lifeline, um, but even that has been weaponized. And, um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, the amount of aid that has entered Gaza has declined. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, what we've seen in the last couple of weeks is air uh, governments starting to drop assistance by air um, and announcements of a potential maritime corridor and uh, of a maritime corridor and um, and other initiatives. Um, but this is no replacement or alternative to the land routes that humanitarian organizations are you are using and should be allowed to use without um, restrictions. Children are being starved as you know, hundreds of trucks filled with food are waiting at the border to enter Gaza. We're also calling on governments who have um, announced suspensions of funding to UNRWA to resume funding. Um, UNRWA is the backbone of the humanitarian response in Gaza and no organization in Gaza will be able to, um, to deliver the assistance required without um, that support. We're also calling for accountability. And, you know, the decades of no accountability is really why we are what we're, where we are today. Um, we're calling specifically on accountability for children and the Secretary General of the UN to list all parties to the conflict as perpetrators of grave violations against children in armed conflict 
in the Secretary General's uh, annual report on children in armed conflict. Um, and with that, I'll end and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Saye. Let me, on behalf of uh, the committee, uh, seize this opportunity uh, to express uh, our appreciation for the crucial work that the NGOs are courageously uh, carrying out in the field. And Sir Richard International is, is really at the forefront. Uh, thank you for your presentation. The destruction of schools and healthcare facilities, the obstruction of uh, uh, to the delivery of humanitarian assistance and the denial of health care to children. I think all this is simply most serious. We thank you for all the insights you shared with us, including uh, the impact of the war uh, on Gaza, uh, the impact also on, the ch on children's rights, and also on the physical and mental health of children. Once again, thank you so very much. I would like now to open the floor for comments and questions by committee members and observers and uh, for the audience. But uh, let me uh, introduce, uh, welcome uh, my friend, uh, the chair of uh, the uh, special committee uh, to investigate Israeli practices affecting the human rights of the Palestinian people and other Arabs of the occupied territory, Ambassador Mohan Puris, welcome. Thank you for attending this meeting and we really appreciate and value the work you are doing uh, uh, in leading the activities of the committee and doing so engaged and so uh, so uh, passionate about uh, the rights of the Palestinians. So now the floor is uh, open uh, for colleagues. Uh, so I will be uh, Seeing if there is someone, I can't see anyone for the time being. I think I saw earlier. Uh, okay, yeah, Mr. Chair, you have the you have the floor, Ambassador Pierce. You have the floor. Uh, th thank you, Ambassador Nine, uh, for giving me the floor. Uh, I can only say that my heart bleeds, having listened to the horror stories in the last one hour. I don't need to say any more uh, because there's nothing more to say. It's really an indictment on the international community to let this, uh, the, the, let this aggression unfold itself in the way it does uh, until uh, to the complete detriment of the Palestinian people. It's unimaginable that in this day and age, we can just sit back and watch it unfold unabated. And I say it's an indictment on all of us, us diplomats, the UN, and perhaps the, the world community uh, to, uh, to, uh, to allow this uh, conduct to go unabated. So as far as I'm uh, as far as we are concerned, uh, you, you probably uh, I chair the Israeli Practices Committee along with uh, my colleague Sheikh Nain, and uh, we uh, we will do everything within our power to try and uh, bring about, uh, quite apart from bringing about a, a settlement where two, uh, two, uh, uh, the two-state settlement, that's a nice academic exercise that we diplomats can engage in. But what is important, as was, has been emphasized by every one uh, speaker here, is that what we need is an immediate ceasefire, an immediate ceasefire. There is no question about it. All the other things cannot follow if there is no immediate ceasefire. We need an immediate ceasefire. That's a sine qua non, if I was to put it in legal terms. So, uh, my dear colleagues, uh, we are with you, heart and soul, uh, silently suffering with you, silently suffering with the people of Palestine and perhaps even the people of Israel who probably must be under tremendous trauma. And we urge all right-thinking people uh, to, to, to join us together uh, in one voice in condemning the aggression and uh, seeking an immediate ceasefire 
and uh, perhaps bring to bear every pressure we have on those who matter, the leaders of the world, uh, the leaders of the United Nations, the, the office bearers who hold high positions, and particularly my brothers and sisters of the Arab world, to try and apply the kind of pressure that they are capable of doing, and which I think uh, is not done in sufficient manner uh, to bring to bear on the Israelis that a ceasefire must be uh, something imminent and that uh, the ceasefire must be something that must be brought about as a matter of absolute urgency. So, uh, quite frankly, I can only uh, convey my condolences to every one of those families who have lost their, their wives, their husbands, their mothers, fathers, their children, their grandchildren. Uh, it's not a story. It's, a, it's not a nice story to hear. It's something that must move the hearts of each and every one of us. Uh, and our work in the United Nations becomes perhaps meaningless if we cannot actually bring about uh, this ceasefire that we want so, uh, which is required and that we want so urgently so that we can stop this human suffering from proliferating on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so, uh, Sheikh Nain, uh, Ambassador Nain, the, uh, and my friends who spoke, and to all of those who are listening to this program, uh, I say let's join hands together and do what it takes to bring about an immediate ceasefire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Puris, for really uh, summing up what you all feel, and what you all think. I think uh, the uh, necessity to have an immediate ceasefire is a top priority. We all agree with you. You can see that uh, everybody was nodding. So I'm looking forward also to working with you, uh, Ambassador Puris, the two committees, who work hand in hand to make sure that we can coordinate our, our, our outreach and our activities and make sure that we can promote to the best possible way, in the best possible way, uh, our, our, our mission to help uh, free Palestine. So, you know, the presentations were so clear and so compelling that I wasn't even myself expecting to see questions arising. So uh, uh, I don't have any questions or comments from my, from my colleagues, so they totally agree with what you have said. I have just one question from the audience. It's a question coming from uh, uh, Mr. Beverly Voloshin, who is a visiting professor at al Bard College uh, at uh, San Francisco State University. And the question is, uh, first of all, he thanks you for your testimony. That is, how can we use these UN testimonies to change US policy, such as the US will now finally agree to an immediate ceasefire mandated and mediated by the UN? Let me repeat the question. How can we use these UN Testimony, the testimonies you have made to change U.S. policies, uh, such as such that the U.S. will now finally agree to an immediate ceasefire mandated and mediated by the by the U.S. So I don't see any other question from the audience or from uh, from from the floor here from uh, from my colleagues. So what I'm going to do is uh, to give the floor uh, to uh, the panelists. If they want to respond to the question or make their final comments, uh, they are free to do so. So just just uh, unmute and, and start. Okay. Um, I can share at least what yes. we, yes. we met with yes. the Secretary General last week. Um, yes. um, Ambassador Abdel had invited us, a group of Palestinian uh, families from the US, and his message to us was the single most important thing that we can do right now is to share our stories, these human stories, with the public because the change in public opinion is the most critical factor that will drive policy changes mm -hmm. uh, for our leadership and our governments. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any additional comments from uh, the two other panelists? Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 share. Uh, just that I think that we have heard from all the panel members, you know, today the, the, the very uh, grim uh, and uh, devastating uh, situation, reality, 
and mm -hmm. uh, uh, with the special focus of very uh, personal uh, experience and narrative like uh, Dr. Rola, and then uh, from uh, uh, ING or colleagues, uh, Leila, uh, uh, Alex, and, uh, and then uh, my account on the uh, very human experience of the sufferings uh, of the people and the importance of the uh, addressing the vulnerabilities, which are also gender specific, vulnerability specific, and the most importantly, the need for ceasefire. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Lucilla. Uh, I think uh, Ambassador Pierre, is wanted to add something? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, Ambassador Nain, I think this program should be given to every news channel to listen to these ladies and the stories, the horror stories. And I'm sure uh, it, it'll uh, invoke uh, uh, immense uh, sympathy, immense uh, uh, that you'll probably have a uh, perhaps a massive reaction to these stories that are that we can hear firsthand. And I think they should be given to every news channel so that people can be alive to the realities of what's going on on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Pires. I'm sure the divisions for Palestinian rights will, uh, as usual, disseminate uh, uh, this uh, program uh, to social media and also to other uh, press out outlets. I'm sure they will do it and uh, we'll make sure that it is done. Uh, so I would like to thank the panelists for their participation and uh, for the eye-opening insights uh, coming directly from the field. Uh, finally, I would like to once again uh, give the floor uh, to Ambassador Freda Abdelhadi Nafer for her final thoughts. But before that, once again, Ambassador Pieris, my renewed thanks for you being here, which is really a testimony of your commitment to the uh, Palestinian cause. Thank you so very much. Ambassador Fed Abdelhadi Nasser, you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador Nyang, and, and thank you also uh, to Ambassador Paris. And I want to join you um, in expressing our gratitude to all the panelists, to Heli, to Leila, uh, to Dr. Rula and Alexandra for their very important and very moving uh, presentations for being voices um, for the most vulnerable in Gaza, the, the children and the women who are uh, being denied not only food, water and shelter and protection, but being denied their very humanity. And I want to um, offer again my condolences to Dr. Rola for all the tragic loss her family has endured and for her willingness um, to, to share these painful testimonies. And I agree with uh, Ambassador Perez that others need to hear this, um, and particularly here um, in this country, to, to understand the reality of what is happening in Gaza. And I hope that um, this can also be shared by listeners here with their representatives, their senators, their congressmen, their, their governors, and others who, who perhaps are willing to listen. Um, and so we have heard the testimonies and all the appeals and, and we will continue working here on behalf of the Palestinian people at the UN uh, towards bringing an end to these horrors and the unbearable suffering um, and to ensure protection and humanitarian assistance for our people, um, including the life-saving support that is being provided by the UN through UNRWA, through UN Women, through UNFPA and UNICEF and OCHA, where possible in the midst of Israel's unrelenting attacks and, and obstruction and all of these issues uh, were addressed. Um, and also, of course, working for a ceasefire from the very outset of this Israeli war, we have demanded a ceasefire to silence the guns and this is a call that is supported by the majority of the international community, um, insisting that there is no military solution to this crisis or to this injustice as a whole, that a solution can only be found in respect for international law and human rights. Um, Palestine has pursued every possible avenue in the international arena at the Security Council, the General Assembly, the Human Rights Council, 
at the International Court of Justice, at the International Criminal Court, um, to appeal for accountability, uh, to appeal for action to end Israel's illegal occupation and its apartheid regime and aggressions against the Palestinian people and to demand justice. And we will continue to do so, engaging with all countries and every region uh, to protect our people, to alleviate their hardships and promote the fulfillment of their rights and accountability for the war crimes and the crimes against humanity and genocide being perpetrated against them. We and the many with us understand that respect for human rights, respect for international law and the attainment of justice are prerequisites for peace and security. And those who think that peace and security are possible in conditions of oppression and injustice and of the denial of the rights of an entire nation of people are mistaken. We understand this. The committee understands this. UN agencies and the entire humanitarian community understand this. Um, I believe all countries standing in solidarity with Palestine understand this. And the millions of people around the world calling for a ceasefire and a free Palestine understand this. And we are grateful for every effort and for the support to the Palestinian people from every corner of the world. Um, so I would just like to end by thanking the committee and its bureau and the Division for Palestinian Rights uh, for their long years of efforts in support of the rights of the Palestinian people, including uh, their right to self-determination and the right of the Palestinian refugees to return and their efforts for a just, lasting and peaceful solution to the question of Palestine. I uh, would also be remiss if I did not thank all of the UN agencies tirelessly working on the ground to support uh, the Palestinian people, the women and the children and the youth and, and, and the entire population in Gaza in need, but all of our refugees as well um, throughout the region. And UNRWA is, of course, the backbone of this humanitarian operation, along with all of its partner agencies in the UN system. Um, we will continue to work with the committee, with the UN agencies, and all who seek justice and peace. And we hope uh, that our collective efforts will one day bring an end to Israel's illegal occupation, an end to this Nakba, and enable the Palestinian people to attain their long denied rights and to finally live in freedom, dignity, and peace and stability. And I thank you, Mr. Chair, and once again, thank all of our distinguished panelists. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Zerhadi Nasser, for your comments. We have now come to the end of this virtual event. Let me again uh, thank the panelists for sharing the insightful information and personal stories. Your sobering accounts have been uh, enlightening and have once more highlighted uh, the importance of women's perspectives and often uh, burdensome contribution to the achievement of a just and peaceful solution to the question of Palestine. Until we realized that the objective of two states Israel and Palestine living side by side in peace and security with its Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Palestine. It has been an honor to chair this event as usual. And as I mentioned it to uh, my friend, Ambassador Pierce, the Secretariat will prepare a summary of the discussion uh, that will be posted on the committee's website, but also disseminated uh, via social media. And we'll make sure that uh, the information about uh, this uh, program is shared as widely as possible. We look forward to your ongoing engagement and to welcome you in future activities of the committee. Thank you once again to all. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Nyan. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much.